This next session, I think we've been looking forward to for some time now. Rick and I met many months ago and had planned out this concept, and I'm so pleased to see it now coming together because both Rick and Keith are going to walk through a mock negotiation. They're going to endeavor to cover three different issues in an M&A transaction. And this really hits to the spirit of what we're doing with transaction advisors is to understand and uncover the best practice in putting deals together. And collectively, I think we can advance the practice of better, more strategic, more thoughtful negotiations, better deals. And certainly this will hit right home in terms of that ambition. So with that, let me turn it over to Rick and Keith, who are going to lead this next session. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you, William. So my name is Rick Kleiman. I'm joined this afternoon by my Hogan Lovells colleague, Keith Flaum. I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit on behalf of both of us that between the two of us, we have more than six decades of collective <laughs> M&A experience. And it's- Five? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> it's depressing to even say that. But our focus today, as William suggested, is going to be on negotiating M&A deals, and in particular, negotiating certain purchase price formulations that I'm guessing many of you in the audience have dealt with before. And also, we're going to address a growing and at times annoying trend that has emerged in the negotiation of key provisions in the acquisition agreement. And that is the reliance, and I would almost say blind reliance, on these now widely proliferated deal point studies that many of you have seen. These are statistical surveys that purport to tell practitioners what so-called market terms are in a deal. And we'll close with that because we have some interesting and somewhat caustic observations on that. But today we're going to illustrate for you some of the give and take that goes on in negotiating the purchase price formulations that we're going to be talking about today. To do that, we're going to slip into character with me on the buy side and Keith on the sell side. I'm going to play the role of the lawyer for a publicly traded buyer. I know many of you are affiliated with publicly traded companies. In this case, a serial tech acquirer that has its sights set on a target company, a technology company represented by Keith. For most purposes today, we can assume that the target company, Keith's client, is a privately held company. And again, this is a scenario that should be familiar to many of you. You should all have in front of you the materials for today's presentation. Please keep them close at hand because we're going to refer to them periodically. And of course, feel free to interrupt at any time with questions, if you have any, during this session. We're going to begin by talking about acquisition currency, the type of deal consideration that's used by the buyer to pay for the deal. And as most of you know, the basic choices here are cold hard cash, number one, number two, shares of the buyer stock, or some combination of those two. Now, the first chart in the materials behind tab one identifies some of the factors and considerations you have to take into account in determining what type of acquisition currency to use. And let's assume as we move into character that the buyer and the target company have already reached some sort of basic agreement on valuation. So let's have at it, Keith. We've agreed that the company you're representing, the target company, is worth a cool $300 million. And because your client, the target company, has 10 million shares outstanding, that comes out to a price of $30 a share, right? That's right, Rick. What our clients have decided is a price of $30 a share. That's exactly what we want. Yeah. Now, does your client actually have a preference as to whether it would want to receive that $30 a share in stock or cash? What would it prefer? Yeah, so it prefers stock. Our founders have a very low basis in their shares, and they really don't want to pay tax this year. They want to decide when they pay tax, so they'd prefer stock so they can get a tax-free deal. Right. Recognize that one of the key advantages of a stock swap over a pure cash acquisition is the ability to do the acquisition on a tax-free, actually a tax-deferred basis. But I'll tell you, Keith, that we understand your desire for stock consideration in this case. And I will tell you that our bankers and our corporate development folks are not wild about us using our stock as acquisition currency, because a stock deal is simply going to be much less accretive to our earnings per share than a cash deal. And the investment bankers in the audience will tell you that that's because the cost of equity capital in the current market, generally almost in all markets, is 
materially higher than the cost of debt capital in the marketplace. As we show on the chart here, a stock for stock deal is going to be less accretive for the buyer's EPS than a cash deal. But on the other hand, I will say that we're a little cash starved now and given our capital structure and our current debt load, we're not really interested in borrowing money to finance this deal. So thanks for all that background. So I guess you're okay then issuing stock. Yeah, we're going to do a straight stock swap here, what we refer to as a stock for stock deal. The deal price will be paid entirely in shares of my client's stock. But I need you to bear in mind that to issue those shares to your client's shareholders, my client, the buyer, is going to have to rely on an exemption from the securities laws because shares of stock are securities after all. We all know that securities have to be registered with the SEC unless there's an exemption available. The exemption that we're probably going to rely on is going to require those shares to be locked up for a little while and they won't be purely liquid in your shareholders hands. Are they going to be okay with that? Well, they will, but really it depends on what exemption you think about. For Regulation D, you're right, there's a six-month lockup, and the client's fine with that, but there are other exemptions that we should talk about that don't require a lockup, like a 3A10 fairness hearing, which would get us liquid shares. But for the time being, we'll accept these shares that are locked up for six months. We might want to talk about registration rights, but let's leave that to the side for now. Now, because my client shareholders will be getting a big chunk of your client's equity, we'll want to do some type of due diligence on your client, just like your client is doing due diligence on mine. We'll want to get the same types of representations and warranties from your client that you're getting from us, because after all, we're making an investment in your client and we're getting your shares. And as a general matter, we'll want some pretty good symmetry in the acquisition agreement. So again, we'll want symmetry in reps, symmetry in covenants and the like. Yeah, well, I mean, I just have to tell you now, that's just not going to happen. This is not a merger of equals. Your client is a much smaller company than my client is. By my calculation, your client's shareholders are going to end up owning maybe 10%, maybe approaching 15% of the outstanding stock of the combined company when this whole transaction comes down. So forget about symmetry. Well, I don't know, 10 to 15% is a pretty big chunk. We'll certainly want to start with talking about due diligence and we'll at least want to talk about your forecast to see what's coming down the pike since we will be locked up. Okay, well that kind of constrained due diligence may be okay, but remember, we're going to be doing the mother of all due diligence investigations on your company. We're going to look at all of your IP. We're going to look at all of your employment arrangements, all of your licenses, all of your contracts, your disputes, your litigation. You're we're going to be combing through everything. I hope that's making you a little uncomfortable. It, it is making me uncomfortable. <laughs> But if you want to do some high-level due diligence under a mutual confidentiality agreement, of course, we're happy to tell you about the quality of our consideration and what our earnings are going to be. Well, we'll talk about the at. level of due diligence, and okay. we'll, we'll get into that. But let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about the exchange ratio. Well, why is that the elephant in the room? It's pretty simple, really, the way I look at it. The price we've agreed on is $30 a share, correct? And you know that my clients... The buyer's stock price has been hovering around $15 per share. So we're going to agree on an exchange ratio, a fixed exchange ratio of two shares of my client's stock, that's $15 a share, for every outstanding share of your client's stock. That's a two to one exchange ratio. Two times 15 equals 30, right? It's a simple stuff. You don't need a PhD in higher mathematics to figure this out, a two for one exchange ratio. That is simple math, Rick, but you miss sort of a major issue. There's going to be a long period of time or potentially a long period of time between the signing of the deal and the closing of the deal. And the stock's going to fluctuate in that time period if you use a two for one and the value then is going to fluctuate. We don't want to be subject to that huge value fluctuation. We want $300 million. We don't want two shares per stock. So again, above my head here, in your exchange ratio, if your stock is here at 15, sure, it's 300 million. But if your stock goes down here, guess what? It's only a $100 million deal, and that's not going to work you're, for us. You're actually client. worried about our stock going down from $15 to $5 a share in the relatively short time between signing and closing? We don't know how long it's going to be, and it could do that. And again, my clients are focused on the $300 million. So we'd like a fixed value deal a floating exchange ratio deal. So what you're saying is you want a deal where the exchange ratio actually changes so that if we are at $15 a share, yes, we're Well, we're, what we're, I want is a deal that gets one. me $300 million. So right. this is the deal that I want. So in effect, if our stock price did go down to $5 a share, you would be saying 
you want the exchange ratio to adjust automatically to six to one from two to one. That's a pretty extreme ask, I would say. And I would also tell you, Keith, that I think you're looking at the wrong end of these diagrams. We've talked about the tremendous revenue and cost synergies that this deal is going to generate. Tremendous. I mean, we're both elated about this deal and how this is going to be a great deal for all parties. And I think we all know that my client's stock, the buyer stock, is going to rise well above $15 a share, maybe up to $20 or $25 a share because of this deal, because of the synergies generated by this deal. And the street is going to think it's a wonderful deal here. Your stock is going to be worth like 400 or 500 million. In I love hearing that. Then you shouldn't be worried about a floating exchange ratio because you're so sure the stock is going to go up. My client will be happy because it'll get us well, $300 well, million. Yeah, yeah well, if you left shares and your client will be happy. Yeah. But look, here's the problem with the floating exchange ratio. This is why you'll rarely see a floating exchange ratio other than in the elephant and the flea situation. GE is buying some tiny little publicly traded company, maybe it can do a pure floating exchange ratio. But the problem with a floating exchange ratio is that if my stock does go down a little bit, the number of shares that I have to issue goes up significantly. And if it goes up high enough, in other words, if instead of owning to 15% of the outstanding combined company shares, your former shareholders end up owning 17% or 18%, we'll actually have to have a shareholder vote on our end. And nobody wants that. That's going to create uncertainty for the deal. You're going to want an even higher price because of the uncertainty that my shareholders might vote this deal down. It opens up a can of worms that none of us wants. Now, I could see doing a floating exchange ratio like this if we collar it. And we've shown in the diagrams what a collared floating exchange ratio would look like. Again, for those mathematically inclined, at least it will cap. There will be some maximum level of dilution. I'll know that under no circumstances will my client have to issue more than a certain number of shares. And I commend to you, particularly those of you that are in part of the number crunching game, if you've never gone through this exercise before, the numbers are up there, the charts are up there. But this is a real issue for us. Now, let's step out of character very briefly, Keith. This is a major fight in a lot of deals. There's no question about the fact that fixed exchange ratios are a little more common. Things get a little more complicated if Keith's client is a publicly traded client rather than a privately held client. Why is that so? Because if Keith's client is publicly traded, all of a sudden the arbitrageurs step into the act. And one of the things that the investment bankers in the room will tell you that particularly when you use some of these exotic exchange ratio formulations, the right move for the arbitrageurs is to take a long position in the target company stock and then short the buyer stock as a hedge, putting downward pressure on the buyer stock price, snapping the collar and creating problems for everyone. So I guess we'll end by saying, as you negotiate this, get a good lawyer and get a good banker to help negotiate the purchase price formulation and the exchange ratio formulation. Anything else in the way of just out of character commentary on this, Keith? Well, you started with keep it simple. It definitely could get complicated when you start to think about the exchange ratios. Right. Speaking of not keeping things simple, we're going to move to our second topic, which is another type of pricing formulation, and that's the earnout. I think most of you in the audience know what an earnout pricing formula is. By a show of hands, how many of you have actually dealt with earnouts before? So, most of you. Simply how many of you had a good experience with earnouts? Yeah, before? exactly. That's a, that's well, a strong just minority, one, right. really. I'd like to hear from you actually <laughs> <That's> uh, <right. laughs> afterwards and to provide some testimonials <laughs> because most advisors hate earnouts because of their complexity or love them because of their complexity and all the extra input they get to provide. But simply put, for the few of you that may not know what an earnout is, it's a mechanism that allows all or part of the purchase price to be paid after the closing of the acquisition based on the post-closing performance of the business that's actually being sold. You'll find a helpful discussion of earnouts behind tab three of our materials. Slipping back into character, let's assume that Keith and I, unlike the previous vignette, have not agreed on the valuation of his client, the target company. And in fact, we vehemently disagree on valuation. So the decision to utilize an earnout formulation can play out, I guess, something like this. So Keith, you really think 
your client, this target company, this technology company that you're representing, is worth $300 million? I do. Just look at the two-year cash flow and earnings projections. The company is easily worth $300 million. Well, I got to tell you, Keith, we've studied your client's projections and we're, well, let's just say we're a little bit skeptical about the numbers you've shown us and the underlying assumptions that went into generating those numbers. So we've given your numbers a reasonable haircut to bring them back into the zone of reality. And when we look at the adjusted numbers, we can only get to a valuation of 200 million, not even close to the $300 million that your client is insisting on. Well, I guess we're going to have to find a buyer that feels better about our projections, and we'll see you later. We'll find one that likes the $300 million. Yeah, Good luck with that, because every buyer is going to take a look at them with the same skeptical eye that we will, and you're going to have to take a haircut on those numbers. But I will tell you what we're going to do, because you seem so passionate and so intent on getting that $300 million, so confident in these numbers. We're going to ask you to put your money where your mouth is, and that's what an earnout is. It's the classic put your money where your mouth is formulation. We're going to use an earnout pricing formulation. We'll pay your client stockholders $200 million at the closing of the deal. But if the performance of the target company's business after the closing warrants it, your client's shareholders can receive up to an additional $100 million, bringing the total price up to the $300 million you're so stubbornly insisting on. Specifically, if the business hits your one-year EBITDA bogey, your net cash flow target of $10 million in the first year after the closing, we will pay your clients, former shareholders, then former shareholders, obviously, an additional $50 million. And same arrangement for year two. If the business hits your year two EBITDA bogey, which is $12 million in the projections you showed us, the very aggressive projections you showed us, but you seem to believe them, we'll pay your former shareholders yet another $50 million. In other words, make your numbers, and you will hit your $300 million purchase price target. I only ask one thing, and you alluded to it just earlier, keep it simple, just as I described it. You keep talking about keeping things simple and then you add just a ton of complexities. You want an EBITDA-based earnout, a cash flow-based earnout. That's way too complex, Rick, because then you have to start thinking about the charges and the expenses. And I'd rather use something that's measurable and that doesn't have the potential for manipulation like the expenses do. So let's maybe talk about a revenue-based earnout, and then maybe my client will agree to it. Well, the problem with that is that's a little too simple, Keith. You know, I do agree that a top-line metric like revenues is simpler to measure and implement than a bottom-line metric like earnings or EBITDA or straight cash flow. But the problem with using revenues as a metric is that it doesn't really align incentives. And the management team for the business going forward, which are your client's former stockholders, are going to be incented to deliver a lot of flimsy revenues, a lot of unprofitable revenues, a lot of slim margin revenues to the company in order to meet whatever revenue bogey is set. That's the way people act. That's human nature. They respond to incentives. That's not what we want. We want a healthy bottom line. So yeah, I agree it would be simpler, but it would be stupid from our standpoint. Well... Again, if you want to keep it simple, we need to talk about revenue. If you want to make it more complex, we can talk about doing a cash flow based earn out, but there are going to be a host of issues that we need to talk about. In fact, I put together a whole slide presentation on just those very issues. So if you look at the next slide, the first question at the bottom of the slide is, what revenues count? Before we even get to the expense side, what revenues count? Is it going to be limited to specific products that my client is currently selling? If so, I worry about that, because what if you take our technology and you put it into a new product and you call it something else, you can design around it. So what revenue counts is going to be critical. Yeah, but suppose we take a little tiny bit of your technology and drop it in there. Should you get full earnout out credit for that? I mean, We should, but we're going to negotiate that, so it's not going to be simple. If you go to the next slide, how should revenues be allocated if the product sold in a bundle? It's super nice. If you have a product, you sell it one way, there's a list price and everybody knows. What if you sell it in a bundle? Who's going to allocate the price in that bundle? And then what happens if your client uses my client's fantastic product as a loss leader? It gives it away so it could sell some of your existing products. I need to get credit for all of those things. God, that is going to be complicated because that would be a problem even if we had a top line base to earn That's out. That's right. Yeah. And we're only on slide whatever. Yeah. Keep flipping a couple more slides forward to what costs count. There you go. 
Now we got to talk about, we've got the revenue side, what costs are deducted in order to sort of measure the metric? It's easy when I'm a standalone company and I can control my costs. Once I'm a part of GE or whatever large company, how are costs going to be allocated? And so we're going to have to spend a lot of time negotiating that point. Keep flipping. There's a whole host of issues here. If you look at just from the beginning, the second bullet, Will the key employees that have been running this company that know how to sell these products and generate revenue, are they gonna remain in control of the target? And if so, for how long? And by the way, I wanna put that in the agreement to make sure that this team continues to run it. And what happens if wait, we- Wait a second, someone is just really screwing up, we can't terminate them, we can't fire them? You can terminate them after the earnout period, but you're not gonna terminate them early. And if you do, we'll talk about what happens in a minute. Let's go to the next slide. What general level of efforts is your client going to agree to? I want language in the agreement that says your client is gonna make sure that our business is run in a way to maximize the revenue, maximize the EBITDA, so you're not wait, wait, selling. Wait, 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 isn't that the tail wagging the dog? I mean, no. isn't that, you're gonna tell us how to operate one of our units? Uh, Absolutely, because I've got $100 million riding on that, for sure. You can pay me $300 million now and we'll be done, but if you wanna do this 250 and 50, then I want to know not only generally, I, I want specific promises from your client, because your client has told my client that we're going to be independent, that we're going to be such a great part of this big global company, you're going to invest mightily in our product. Let's just put a specific covenant as to how much you're going to invest, what you're going to invest in, and we're going to be able to use your great distribution channel without cost, by the way. Keep flipping, two more. Acceleration events. What happens if I'm successful in negotiating all these covenants and your client breaches them? I know they'll never do that, but what if they did? What if they sell the company? They find out it's so great it's worth 500 million and they sell it the next day. I wanna make sure my client gets paid its $100 million. I want these acceleration events. So if your client sells the company, it sells its assets, you said earlier, you wanna be able to fire my client? Well, if you do, fine then just pay the $100 million. So if you fire them, then the full $100 million accelerates. Yeah. Right, and we're gonna have to distinguish making it even more complex between firing for cause. You know, if your client's embezzling, one of these former shareholders is embezzling, we should be able to fire them without accelerating the earnout. Fine, I'm glad you agree on the concept. We'll talk about the definition of cause. And I also wanna make sure that we talk about the definition of good reason, because it's not just if you fire us, but my client is a very passionate engineer. He doesn't want to be cleaning the restrooms. So if you assign responsibilities that aren't consistent with that, we get to quit and get that so, so, $100 million. So keep, Should I keep going? No, I, we're not going to be able to keep this simple, are we? No. <laughs> so, uh, and let's step out of character here, and this is why I'm interested in hearing from the experience of some of you. It looks like if we do an earn out, we will have the $100 million tail wagging the $200 million dog. The earnout section of the acquisition agreement is going to be twice as long as the rest of the agreement. We'll see 70 dense pages of accounting definitions and covenants and acceleration events and other complicated and cumbersome provisions. It's going to take years, not months, it's going to take years to negotiate this. And by the way, out of character, Keith and I had the privilege of negotiating what I think may be the biggest earnout in history. It was eBay's acquisition of Skype. Talk yeah. about it. So that was crazy, right? So eBay paid $3.9 billion for Skype. That might have been crazy too, but that's a whole separate question because they ultimately got it back on the back end when it was sold to Microsoft. But $2.5 billion up front and a $1.4 billion earnout. You if can, anyone knows of an earnout of more than $1.4 billion, tell us, because we're <laughs> telling people that this is the largest earnout of all time. <laughs> and even if you told us, we'd still say it. So yeah, tell us right. we're we'll say it anyway. But the definition section went on for two and a half alphabets. We got to like triple R of defined terms. It was 27 pages of definitions. There were three metrics. It was a revenue metric, a profit metric, and an active user metric. Who knows what active users are? Yeah, nor did we. So we had to sort of figure that out and negotiate that and put language in that. Yeah. Then we had all kinds of control issues. And there's a saying, earnouts never earned always paid? Well, at the end of the day, eBay did decide to pay one of the metrics out of three different metrics, 
and we kind of went on our way and then sold the company. But, but, but that's one of the reasons that buyers are sometimes a little wary of earnouts. Never earned, always paid. Because if you get to the end of the earnout period and you're looking, you're still valued employees in the eye and saying, oh, sorry, you missed, you know, that $100 million you were counting on? You know, you knew the rules. You're going to have some pretty upset employees. So very often they get settled out and paid out in any event. And I would definitely say that because of the complexity, more deals get proposed as earnouts than actually end up getting done as earnouts because if the target company has a lawyer as skilled as Keith is at this, it becomes a very convoluted process, particularly where the earnout is relatively small relative to the base purchase price. It's just not worth it. And earnouts, in our experience, I'd like to hear your experience at some point. Maybe we'll stick around for the break afterwards and would like to hear from some of you about this. But they almost always, it seems, end up in disputes and commonly end up in litigation. And there's a lot of litigation out there about earnouts. They're proposed as a creative way for the business folks to bridge a valuation gap. But usually there's a reason that there's a valuation gap and the earnout doesn't really bridge it at the end and you end up with a fight on your hands. I will say that if some of our buy side clients do go in with it with their eyes open and they know they're going to have to pay either all of it or some of it, but they want to drive a particular behavior, they want to retain people for a certain amount of time, and this arguably gives them an opportunity to do that. Right. So that's the negotiation that goes on over earnout formulations. They're common in the tech sector, certainly common in the life sciences sector where you have milestone-based earnouts Absolutely. based on regulatory milestones and the like, but they are challenging. And as common as they are, be aware of the challenges before you go into them. To conclude our segment, let's talk about a negotiating vignette that's become all too familiar in the current M&A marketplace, one that may bring back painful memories, I would think, for at least some of you in the audience. So, Keith, we've hammered out the price terms now. We've agreed on the earnout or the exchange, whatever. But at this point, why don't we just go through the rest of the draft definitive acquisition agreement and deal with the non-price terms. Well, as you know, as buyer's counsel, I've sent you our eminently reasonable buyer's first draft. So hopefully, we're not going to have a lot to talk about here and we'll be able to slide through this fairly easily. Unfortunately, Rick, we do have a lot to talk about. And why is that? Well, I've compared your draft agreement, this reasonable buyer's draft agreement, to a recent American Bar Association private target deal point study. And compared to the ABA study, you are way, way off market. Okay, so there it is. That's it. The biggest insult that can be delivered in the current M&A marketplace. You're off market. No way off market. <laughs> Keith, please tell me I'm mean. Please tell mm -hmm. me I'm incompetent. Tell me I'm clumsy. But whatever you do, please don't say I'm off market. How many of you have heard of not a market deal off market? How many of you have been confronted by people that are citing deal point studies in, in one way or another, just by show of hands? It is something that is becoming not only commonplace, but almost ubiquitous in the current negotiating scene. So Keith, give me an example of where we're off market according to this ABA study. Yes, so I will give you an example. We've negotiated 28 pages of representations and warranties covering the waterfront. Litigation, employees, taxes, and then at the very end, you've added what's called a full disclosure rep that says, in addition to those 28 pages of reps and warranties, there's nothing else that's material that you forgot to tell me. You rarely see that according to my ABA study. Well, it's in all of our deals. I mean, we get that all the time. But all right, you're going to have to tell me about this ABA study that purports to measure what's market and that says you never get a full disclosure or so-called 10B5 representation. It's just one example of one of the deal points that yeah. you're objecting to. No, it's a great study. The American Bar Association put together a bunch of lawyers from a lot of different firms, looked at a number of deal points reps and warranties, closing conditions, indemnification provisions, how long the IP rep lasts and the like. And they put together a study that told my client what's market. It's phenomenal. And just what is the sample set for this? Study? Oh, the sample set is unassailable because we're not talking about deals that I just pulled from the cabinet. These are publicly filed deals. These are deals that are filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. So all of us can go and look at them 
and see how these statistics come out. Yes. So let me follow up on that for a second. Doesn't that mean that all of the deals that my client does and all the deals that are done by companies similar in size to my client, you know, my client has a market cap well above $100 billion. Think Oracle, Intel, Google, Amazon, GE, whatever. Doesn't it mean that all the deals done by my client aren't going to be in this study? Well, you know, I guess that's right, but you know, it's the best study that we have. It's the ABA study. It's well, but let me follow up on that. When my client does a $300 million deal, it's a rounding error. That's not a material deal from my client's standpoint. Because it's not a material deal, my client doesn't even have to publicly announce it, but it certainly doesn't have to file the deal documents with the SEC on an 8K. So this study only covers deals you've just said, that get filed with the SEC. Therefore, the results of this study that you're citing and that are being cited so often in negotiations today is a flawed study. The results are skewed. It only includes the deals done by smaller buyers where the SEC materiality standard is satisfied because a $300 million deal, for example, mm -hmm. is always going to be material to a buyer with a $1 billion market cap. It just won't be material to a buyer with a $100 billion market cap. So, so I guess you're right. Some of those deals aren't filed, but it's still none tracks. of those deals are filed. Oh. Yeah, it right. still tracks publicly filed deals. Yeah, well, it tracks publicly filed deals, but the fact of the matter is that the deals that are excluded from that study, that's the market my client is playing in. It. It's playing in the market where serial acquirers with big market caps are going out and buying companies, and you would expect that serial acquirers with big market caps have a little bit more negotiating leverage than these small, tiny, publicly traded companies that buy the companies in the deals that are covered by that study. Wouldn't you agree? Well, so I, I get the point. Deals done by bigger buyers aren't included in the survey. But how do we even know what the terms are that those bigger buyers get? I'm certainly not going to go ask those bigger buyers about that. Well, I know. I know anecdotally that the bigger buyers get better Oh, so I should trust than you? The, than the smaller buyers surveyed in the ABA Okay, study. so I should, I should take your word on that. Yeah, because I've seen them. <laughs> but you really don't have to take my word for it, because I've included in the materials some excerpts from a brand new study. Call this the antidote to this nonsense <laughs> that's been going on. So new, in fact, that it hasn't even been officially issued yet. It's marked draft, and you should respect it as a draft that way. It's behind tab four. So what I've included is a very advanced draft of the study, good enough to circulate it to all of you here. It's a joint effort by the ABA and SRS Aquiam. There are some SRS Aquiam representatives in the audience here, and this audience has the honor of seeing a preview. This study is really done for those of you who are affiliated with or who regularly advise, in the case of the advisors in the room, large cap buyers. This is a tool that you can actually use, a godsend, really, something to throw in the face of the obnoxious sell-side lawyers who robotically cite these skewed market statistics to support their distorted negotiating positions that are incredibly frustrating. So let's look at the excerpt that we've included because it happens to address this full disclosure representation that you cited, Keith. By the way, here are all the deal points covered in the study. The study is keyed around a new metric that you should all be aware of. I called it, we called it buyer power ratio or BPR, but it is very simple. It's simply the buyer's market cap divided by the size of the deal. If you have a huge buyer doing a relatively small deal, buying a relatively small company, you would expect to get highly buyer favorable terms there because of the negotiating leverage involved. So if you have a buyer with a $150 billion market cap buying a $300 million company, you can do the math and find that it's a buyer power ratio of 500, which is very different than a $600 million market cap company buying a $300 million company, which is a buyer power ratio of just two. It's very simple. If you look at the 10B5 or full disclosure rep, and you know Keith boldly said that in only a small percentage of the cases, according to the ABA study, which is based on publicly filed documents, a skewed sample set, do you see this 10B5 rep? 
you find out that he's right. This is the ABA study here to the left, the pie chart to the left, that you end up with the buyer favorable outcome, which is, yes, including a 10B5 rep, only about 30% of the time, and about 70% of the time, there is no 10B5 rep at all. But if you look at the data from this new study, you see that when the buyer power ratio is greater than 200, in our hypothetical acquisition it's 500, all of a sudden the statistics skew in the other direction. And you see that a majority of the time there is a 10B5 rep in there. And this is just one deal point that we're using for illustration here. This bar chart shows it even more clearly. There's a clear correlation between increases in the buyer power ratio and increases in the incidence of buyer favorable terms. Now, our advice to you is not necessarily to use this study because when people throw studies in your face in one direction or the other, that's not negotiation or that's what we call negotiating by the numbers. It's becoming very common here and it's obnoxious, it's annoying, and it's wrong. We all know that every acquisition is unique, that you can't look at provisions in a vacuum. We yearn for the days of people negotiating by logic and not by statistics. Part of the fault here is some of the investment bankers who say, well, once we've negotiated the price, we want a market deal, as if there is such a thing as a market deal. But there isn't. And if you are going to talk about a market deal, then at least talk about the market that you're playing in. In this case, with the serial acquirers that we tend to represent, it's a very different market than the sample set shown by the ABA study. And by the way, I should mention, for those of you that are interested in this, many of you may not be, but if you find yourself interested in these statistics and you'd like a copy of the entire study, when it comes out, it's going to be released formally in about three or four weeks. It's going to have some impact and some changes in the way the non-price provisions are negotiated, and even some of the price provisions, or some of the economic provisions. How big is the escrow? What reps go beyond the escrow? All the stuff that you've negotiated in the past. Just give me your business card. Unfortunately, we're so new at Hogan Lovells that we don't even have business cards yet. <laughs> but just write on the back of your business card, new deal point study, and we'll make sure you're on the list and get the full study out to you. Keith, any concluding comments? No, just that I'm usually on the buy side, so I'm very happy about this study, notwithstanding I play the sell side on TV. <laughs> if there are any people that have any observations or questions on anything we've talked about or on any aspect of negotiating M&A deals, we spent our lives doing that. We're M&A lawyers 24-7, so there's probably not much we haven't seen in the marketplace, public or private. Hi. Have you ever negotiated an earn-out deal in a public-to-public -public case? I know we know of a couple of precedents. We have. It's in, there's a lot in the life sciences space called contingent value rights, and sometimes those, those, those CVRs trade separately, and sometimes they don't. That's where you see it most often. Yeah, and you see other in the life sciences space, royalty trusts, etc. It's very difficult because you have to hire a monitor of have you met the bogeys, and they tend to be much simpler than the types of complicated earnouts you see in the private company space. And as a practical matter, you just don't see a lot of earnout type arrangements in the public company space because they're flaky and a competing bid that's all cash or all stock and that doesn't have a contingent component is usually going to be able to prevail in the competitive bidding situation that by definition almost always exists in the public space because unlike in the private space even when you've signed and announced a deal in the public space someone can always come in over the top and lob in a topping bid. But again in the life sciences area if you have a product that's not yet to market or you've got a new product among others you need to get value from yeah, that. Yeah, I think so. Sanofi Genzyme for example is one of the prototypical examples of the equivalent of a relatively simple earnout in that space. Other questions or other observations? Great, we'll stick around for the for the break and thank you for your patience.